it's the million dollar question, isn't it? Uh, yeah. But in my experience, customers, um, when, when the imperative that has changed behavior uh, eggs away, customers rarely unlearn new habits. Never in the field of human country. How do you measure such an astonishing moment in history? You're listening to the Big Quest podcast with Andy Murray. In a high stakes, unpredictable world, every day is ripe with blue ocean adventures just waiting to be discovered. You need the mindset, the methods, and the motivation to lead with confidence into the unknown. Come along as we talk to today's top leaders, known for simplifying challenges, outsmarting variables, and inspiring greatness. Welcome to the Big Quest Podcast. How you doing, Andy? Hey, Ben. I'm great, and I'm really looking forward to today's show. Yeah, today we're talking to one of your old colleagues, Roger Burnley, the CEO of ASDA, where you were, one of Britain's largest grocery retailers. Uh, you're familiar with this. You know, I noticed that Roger's one of the sharpest people that w- I think we've ever had on a podcast before. And it might be because he has a British accent, so I'm not really sure. <laughs> well, I can assure you, Roger's the real deal. I uh, had the privilege of working for Roger for about, I think, two and a half, three years while I was in ASTA. And, you know, I've worked with many CEOs over my career, and you learn something from each, as each person has their own style and unique way of doing things. And what I really appreciated and learned from Roger is the importance of not just being strategic and making the hard choices, but also building a culture of listening, uh, empathy, being able to uh, leverage his team in unique ways. And that really unlocks a lot of opportunity for each person to bring them bring their best self to work. And I think that is a secret sauce, a secret superpower that Roger brings to the role. You know, when you look at uh, the supermarket industry in the UK, it is one of the most competitive, uh, difficult jobs you can have because it plays such an important role in the community uh, in so many different ways. And what I had experienced uh, and why I wanted Roger to join us is that he really brings a sense of harmonizing what is required to do those jobs and stay out in front in a competitive environment. And that is the ability to harmonize executing Friday's payroll with excellence and the importance of staying on top of that and moving it forward while at the same time balancing the importance of inventing the future. And it's very difficult to um, navigate those two worlds and keep them in balance. And I think Roger did a great job of that. Uh, he inspired an innovation fund and lots of R&D things going on to start small, prototype, get ideas out there, and let's just keep moving at the same time by running the business. And it allows people that have big ideas, uh, a big quest on their mind to flourish because you can have the confidence that it's okay to try things and fail. And it's okay to um, experiment and learn and those things were uh, a key mark of his uh, leadership style. So it's a great, great person to have on the Big Quest. I think we're going to learn a lot. And I, let's just jump in. Hey, Roger, it's great to see you today. How are you doing? I'm good, Andy. Great to see you again, too, my friend. Yes. Well, thank you for taking some time out of what is a very busy uh, role you have and schedule at this time of year, especially uh, to share with us some of your thoughts. And probably the best place to start is just to uh, have you take us a little bit on a journey from where you thought about retail and decided to go down this path to where you are today. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, I'm, I'm a retail lifer. Uh, so I started out a million years ago as a graduate trainee at uh, B&Q, which is kind of Home Depot in the UK. Uh, uh, and uh, I then moved into food retail um, into ASDA, actually. Uh, then I had 10 years uh, on the board at Sainsbury's. Uh, mm-hmm. Really proud to have been part of, of, of the team that uh, made Sainsbury's great again, as we said at the time. And then I've been back here at ASDA for four years, uh, the last three as uh, CEO. Wow, that's, that's fantastic. And, you know, here uh, we have quite a few people that are tied to Walton College of Business and retailing, uh, the retailing center and such. And when you say retailing, a lot of students don't think retail. I mean, the first thing is like folding sweaters in a department store or something like that. But 
what most people don't realize, and I really realized it from six years at Walmart and, and Asda, is the diversity of skills and and what's really involved. And not only that, it's the speed of the game. And so if you had a, a two minute elevator pitch on why you should really think about a retail career, uh, what would that be to students? Yeah, you, you make a really good point. And, and, and that will be that, as you say, uh, marketing, logistics, supply, operations, uh, merchandising, all those things, fa fa financing all its yep. galleries, all those things come under the umbrella of retail. And I'm a firm believer of the Peter principle that we all get promoted to one level beyond our uh, capability. I think that keeps you humble with the right attitude. But if I look back on my career, one thing that has always stood me in good stead is to have done uh, as many of those facets of retail as possible. So. Uh, right when it might feel good to move upwards, but instead to move sideways into a new area that you haven't got, uh, haven't had experience in. So at a pretty young age, a long time ago now, I'd covered, I, I'd been in store management, I'd been in commercial, I'd been in, in logistics, and uh, I would always um, advocate that to, uh, to students that it's a great grounding across so many areas. Well, the path to CEO, which you obviously have, have achieved, uh, is taking you through a number of different disciplines inside of retail. Was there anyone that served you best to prepare for this particular job? Yeah, undoubtedly, um, being, being a store manager um, back in the day, I think there's no substitute. I always say, yep. uh, you know, in, in, in the end, the uh, however centralized you become as a retailer, the difference uh, in a great store and a store with opportunities is the caliber of the store manager and the uh, and, and the uh, the culture uh, he or she engenders across the store. So that would be the one role that um, I'm I'm really admiring of anyone who has done that role and then moved on into other disciplines uh, of the organisation uh, in any retailer. And what's interesting, I think, about a store manager role, you can get into that role fairly early in your career versus it being a general manager type role, and you are really a general manager. And almost a mayor of the town in some ways. But I mean, that's what's cool about it is you can get to that role. I don't know what the typical range of time, but five to seven years, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And uh, and uh, I love the mix we have of extremely experienced uh, store managers who have you know, forgotten more than I know about Christmas mm -hmm. and, and the things to make sure you've got in check. But the vibrancy and new thinking that we get from uh, our, our younger store managers and, and we we have younger and younger uh, mm. store managers entering retail in general and certainly at Asda and that's really healthy. Yeah, well quite a, good, quite a strong leadership team I think of, of store managers that I experienced and uh, you really sense that they not only understand their store but they understand their community and staying in the community. I would suppose uh, perhaps with COVID that being connected to the community is more important than ever. Yeah, definitely. And I think in retail, you know, when in, in general terms, big big business is seen as, as faceless and 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 it's it's not too many. There, there are clearly exceptions, but many big big business big businesses are seen as uh, you know a, a opposed to society in some respects. Uh, for, for supermarkets to be local and be in their community and be. Uh, be clearly wanting to contribute and give back in that community is really important and customers uh, look, look, look to that more and more uh, despite the digital, the digital, increasingly digital world that we're in. So I think it's really, really important. I think if people, have, uh, those that have worked in the UK could relate to this, but I tell my mates here that uh, I think the UK is probably about five years ahead in uh, retailing, grocery retailing and understanding the role it can play in the community. It's just it's still a bit evolving here, and I think probably COVID is forcing a tighter and stronger look at the community. But, but maybe it's because of the competitive environment where you could be in a car park and see a Sainsbury's, a Morrison's, or an Asda in fairly close proximity. If you're not connecting to the customer in their local community, it gets to be really a tough, tough road from a competitive standpoint. Yeah, you're right. Uh, uber competitive, and uh, many would see while well, we inside the industry know the differences between the different retailers in the UK. If you've landed from Mars, as it were, you would think that Tesco and Sainsbury's and Morrison's and Asda are very close together in terms of proposition. Uh, that's probably because we're quite good at it 
yeah. uh, and we've all reached a reached the sort of status quo of, of balancing everything to give a great proposition to customers. But you're dead right. Um, increasingly, things like range and price can become hygiene factors that people take for granted, and it's how you show up for customers, the extra things you you do, be that service, uh, be that in the community that can that can make the difference. Many of the retailers in the UK have. Um this idea of a customer division or such to get close to the customer. And I think the big eye opener, and that's not as common in the US, uh, and the big eye opener for me from having the opportunity to, to work for you and be in that role uh, was to see actually, actually how much the CEO has to uh, be that, that voice and connecting point to the customer. And I was blown away by how many letters you get uh, people still see the CEO as the face of a brand um, in a very visceral way. Um, so maybe it would be helpful to, to hear your perspective on what it means to be you know, connected to customers and how does that show up to you as the CEO? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great point and it's certainly been a, a learning for me. So I think we've all in, in, in executive positions, we've all got used to receiving some inbound directly from customers and members of the public. Um, as uh, w when I became CEO three years ago, I would maybe get 25, 30 emails a day. Bear in mind, my email address isn't officially out there. It's people right. deducing it or, or finding it on the web. That had stepped up to a couple of hundred. So, for example, by last December, I was getting maybe 25 a day about plastics, uh, often from school children, often from young people. Then through COVID, that reached well over a thousand, up to two thousand emails a day from customers. Which, to your point, Andy, just shows that where customers have questions, have anxiety, have angst, the CEO um, is the brand. But of course, for me, that gives a fantastic, rich vein of feedback to know how you're doing. And I've long been a believer that in a business this size something can happen once or twice inevitably maybe four or five times but if something's happened 10 times then you have to assume it's everywhere and you have to go fix it uh well i've had that rich vein of feedback this year so i've often looked to myself as to is it a good use of my time to mm. to read all these emails and of course i speed read them and scan them but i do uh do exactly that every day i make a little time every day to speed read and scan all those emails because it is the best feedback um, I will ever get. And I deliberately get involved in answering uh, a handful of them myself yeah. uh, every day, at least a couple uh, every day myself. And I get involved in what I want the answer to be if there's a theme. So uh, to your point, you know, that it would surprise some people that the CEO of a large organization will get involved. But on the 23rd of December at midnight, I was finding a, P a PlayStation 5 for a customer where something had gone wrong and I knew we'd kept a few in reserve and we got that PlayStation to that customer next morning. And she probably didn't realize that I'd done that in person, uh, but yeah. I had, and you know, that's good because you see the angst that we've caused and you see sure. you know, what, what we need to do to fix it. Well, it really puts you so close to real customer insight, really. I mean, I know uh, from being, uh, as part of the, your team, it, it's easy to look at customer data and say, well, that's not a trend, but there's nothing as visceral in real time as getting real customer letters and interacting with customers, whether it's in stores or what you're getting in emails. I mean, that is kind of the truth. It's at least truth for them. Yeah, and I, and I think uh, you, you and I were very like-minded in, first of all, uh, stopping things at a, uh, spotting things and fixing things at a granular level to, to, to stop them becoming a trend. That's or right. to assume that they probably are a trend from the, uh, you know, out of 20 million customers uh, a week in Asda, that's only a few thousand uh, finding the capacity to, to write to me. Um, and so uh, it, it, I think it's really important and it keeps you grounded. And it is also a rich vein of positive feedback as well. So it isn't all about the opportunities. It is uh, really encouraging you when as a brand and an organization, we're getting things right. Uh, and as individuals and individual stores, we're getting things right. So it's great to give to have that opportunity to celebrate as well. Well, I can't imagine what happened with your inbox with COVID, which brings me up to a question I wanted to ask, because fortunately or unfortunately, March 20th is when I left the UK, really before the lockdown really happened. But I, I've been dying to ask you, 
uh, t- what, what did it feel like? And take me to that moment when you realized as CEO that everything's changed and, and this is a real situation and you've got 120, 130,000 essential workers. And, you know, I mean, it's just the, the, what did that moment feel like? And can you, is there any specific moment where it kind of all dawned on you that you're in a, you're in a different place? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question, Andy. I, I think two things. First of all, when right at a very busy, uncertain time with new, new challenges every, every hour, never mind every day, we'd emptied our home offices. And so, you know, you'll recall, we don't even do that on a sleepy Tuesday in Friday, a sleepy Tuesday in February in case we messed up the business. And suddenly at the busiest time, we emptied all the home offices and we're remote working and with no real end in sight as to when we'd we'd be back. Um, And secondly, when in the moment uh, you realise that the, I realise that the the safety uh, and well-being of our colleagues needed to be the very first thing we thought about every day, closely followed by the safety of our customers, followed then by our customers' needs. And that was quite a moment to know that it was that serious, that we had to balance this doing the right thing for our customers and being a commercial going concern still, but having uh, doing the right thing for our colleagues right front and center. And we have lost uh, we've lost 39 colleagues between April and December this year to COVID. Um, and after every single one of those, you know, you need to go for a walk and think about the decisions um, you're making, I'm making in that balance of looking after our colleagues. Um, equally, you know, I think in, in, in the scheme of things through that time, we've, um, we, we've, we've always had our colleagues' um, safety yeah. front and center. I, I'm curious on what you learned from a leadership perspective about, because clearly there's amazing things that you guys were doing. I kept track of the new ways you were um, wanting to serve customers differently, you know, happy to chat kind of buttons and such with drivers that I thought was just really so spot on. Um, but were there any kind of leadership lessons that came out of how you lead teams, how you lead the organization, how you set priorities or so that you might take forward uh, as just kind of came to light as a way of doing business over the last you know nine or ten months. Yeah, I think um, firstly uh, it, it sounds like management textbook stuff, but mm-hmm. never has there been a, a a more real example of the fact that you just cannot give any sort of certainty uh, to to colleagues, uh, but you can give clarity and reassurance. Um, that, you know, that we're doing the right thing, this is what we're doing. Can I tell you what next month is yeah. going to look like? Absolutely not. Um, but we're doing the right thing and, and you're doing the right thing and together you know, we'll, we'll look after our customers and we'll get through this. So that managing uh, through uncertainty, uh, wow, I think we've all learned so much um, this year. And secondly, back you, you raised the point earlier, but back to this, the importance in the community. So, yeah. you know, loneliness has been such a, a tragic um, side effect of COVID, hasn't it? That the very people that we normally want to make sure we look after and touch, physically touch uh, and spend time with um, are the people we have needed to uh, leave isolated. And so... We, we felt that that very much. And that's where things like the Happy to Chat badge um, came from. And you know, we, we quickly realized that online drivers uh, might be the only person literally a customer was going to see or speak to in, in a day or in a week. Uh, and that feedback came from the colleagues themselves, uh, wow. as so many good ideas invariably do. So you know, just, just one example. Well, on that uh, example, I would suppose that perhaps pre-COVID, there might be a financial discussion. What's the ROI of that? Perhaps I mean you are slowing down drivers, maybe, but you know, did that kind of ROI analysis and all of that factor into the decision making, or he said, no, this is the right thing to do. Let's just go do it. Yeah, no, this is the right thing to do. Let's just go do it. And um, you know, we uh, there are there are two kind of models of, of online uh, in the UK and, uh, and I think in the world, which is the store pick model and the the dark store 
model uh, and we're very much in the, the store pick model as predominantly but not exclusively the uh, the UK is uh, uh, and that paid dividends so our online already already relatively mature in the UK uh, in, in, in comparison to uh, most other countries but still only seven percent market penetration uh, that moved it had taken uh, it, it had taken 13 years to get to seven percent market penetration that doubled overnight. Uh, that doubled in three weeks, to be exact, to uh, to fourteen percent, and therefore we knew, you know, we, we knew that we could afford to do that well and do it right. And the drivers and the personal, uh, the personal touch have definitely um, been part of that. And it's also been part of the store being the centre of the community because yeah. now, whether we have some stores where forty percent of their throughput now is online groceries. Uh, but that's a customer deciding how they want to interact with their store in the community by click and collect, by having deliveries or by coming and shopping in person. So it reinforces the store in the community. I see. I get it. You know, it would be easy, I would think, in an operational emergency survival type mode to ditch some priorities that might be invent the future as you're focused on Friday's payroll, but but you haven't. And I'm just curious on your decision making around like Stevenage, which is still getting written up as some of the best new technology. Uh, I think it's been recently awarded in the Middleton store for sustainability. So yeah. somehow you've been able to keep a bit of pressure on both skis of inventing the future because these are really forward looking things at a time when you could have all the excuses in the world to, to not do that um, and just deliver. And so uh, what was in your thinking this, that caused you to say, I'm going to keep pressure on both skis. Yeah, a couple of things really. Firstly, I don't think, uh, certainly through a lot of this year, there has been no end in sight uh, now. Uh, thank goodness uh, there is. So uh, the Oxford AstraZeneca uh, vaccine in the UK given approval this morning, um, which should mean uh, with 100 million vaccines for 60 million people, uh, in the UK that we get to a better place in 2021. But we'll we all know we'll never go back to normal. And certainly through most of last year, it became the new normal, didn't it? So life had to carry on. Um, uh, and secondly, uh, what mattered to customers still mattered to customers. So um, I said earlier, b before all this, last year I was getting maybe 25 emails a day about plastic. At the start of uh, COVID, for two months, I didn't get one single email about plastic. For just for a moment, that felt like a first world problem. But then it came back with a vengeance, and it is back with a vengeance. And I think it's something even more uh, around our customers, you know, just not wanting to mess up things, the planet, uh, uh, anymore. And so it's been important to, to still plow on with those things that are still on customers' minds, even if they were secondary for a limited period of time. And secondly, on the on the tech and innovation front and Stevenage store specifically, you know, on the one hand, um, you know, online, uh, on the one hand, uh, the big weekly shop has taken us sort of back 20 years, but things like online have pushed us forward 20 years. Um, and definitely, you know, progress uh, arguably has been accelerated and equally, all the headwinds that we face aren't going away as an industry and therefore it's been important to, to still be on it. So yeah, I'm really pleased with a lot of the innovation that we've continued to um, to push at Stevenage. Well, it's very customer centric from what I can see. And I'm curious if you're seeing any trends or have a crystal ball about how customer shopping is gonna change or is it, do you think it'll go back the way it was or how much of it do you think is gonna be sticky and going yeah. forward? I mean, it, 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 it's the million dollar question, isn't it? Uh, yeah. But in my experience, customers, um, when when the imperative that has changed behavior uh, ebbs away, customers rarely unlearn new habits. So yeah. we saw it in the financial crisis uh, in 2008, where customers um, very quickly started to uh, waste less, shop more little and often, be, be savvier. Um, and they didn't uh, they didn't unlearn that. They didn't, at the end of the financial crisis, say, great, let's start wasting one more thing a day uh, in the fridge. And similarly, this time, I think online will be sticky to a degree. Um, and we know we can see that people are shopping online for the very first time uh, this year. 
um, in, in the UK and lots of our customers are shopping online for the very first time. So I expect online to ebb away a little. I expect click and collect to drop back considerably in, in the fullness of time, but that's all relative. Click and collect has been up maybe 400% year on year this year, but we can see that when customers click on the website looking to make a delivery, the first place they go is delivery. If they can't get a slot, they then go to click and collect. So we can see in the data that only some seven or eight percent of customers are actually choosing click and collect. The rest are choosing it as a second choice. Uh, and, and therefore, it's that group that will need to uh, work out. But that will be the, on, online undoubtedly the biggest thing. I do think customers have rediscovered the large, the large weekly shop as well, Andy. Uh, and okay, I didn't know that. Brands. Um, I need to always make sure that isn't wishful thinking, um, but I do think customers have discovered the large weekly shop and the brands that the big supermarkets uh, offer, and we need to make that a, a self fulfilling prophecy as well going forward that uh, that, that behaviour sticks. Big Quest Podcast with Andy Murray will return right after this break. Today, more than ever, we need leaders who lead with the values of excellence, professionalism, innovation, and collegiality, which stand for EPIC. These are the values the Walton College of Business consistently demonstrate. I've worked with the Walton College as a business owner or executive for over 25 years, and I can tell you with certainty, the students we've hired, the exec ed programs, and the insights from their research have made an EPIC impact and continue to inspire me with new ways of thinking. Their vision to bring thought leadership to the challenges business face today, such as business integrity or how to be a customer-centric organization, that adds real value by creating conversations that connect people with organizations, faculty, industry, and practice. I put a link in the show notes to Dean Matt Waller's Be Epic podcast, where you'll hear stories and get great content that will inspire you to be epic. We now return to the Big Quest podcast with Andy Murray. Well, one of the things I picked up from talking to uh, a senior exec at Pepsi was the uh, his projection that there will be a golden era of creativity, as he would say, coming because there's going to be a demand for new and not new that's just another variant, but something really new because the shelves, the SKU count's been reduced. I think Pepsi dropped about 20% of the SKUs and, and only hit 2% of the sales. So it's not like they were really performing, you know, loads of volume behind those SKUs and, and COVID forced that. But then when that's been re, re, reestablished, the, the logistics and things behind that, what are we going to do with the new space? You could refill it back with dog type brands that may not have performed well, but or, or you could really get closer to the customer and try to find out things that really have meaningful um, meaningful value to customers because they've been quite happy with fewer flavors of this, uh, you know, through the COVID experience. And so, uh, do you see a sense that it's going to take um, looking at the space that's out there and what what's coming? And most R and D work has been put on hold for a lot of the supplier community. But how do you get, um, or how are you thinking about? Yeah, there's going to be a demand for new once we get past all of this and logistics and supply lines stabilize. Yeah, that, that's that's a great point, and I think um, you know I think all, all retailers were probably on a journey of range of skew rationalisation. It was certainly and remains our strategy to quite aggressively uh, uh, do that. Uh, why? A because with the data uh, at our disposal, we can do that more effectively than ever before in truly understanding what what line, however fast its rate of sale, it is unique and needs to be in the range and what lines are duplication. And of course, the worst duplication is the proliferation of pack sizes. Uh, and exactly. uh, you know, we don't need 20 variants of the same thing. And to your point, that isn't innovation, is it? That's proliferation. Um, so we were all on that journey. We then had the needs must of working really well with the supply base to say, gosh, okay, if you can put, if you can channel all your demand through just those four SKUs instead of those 10, if that's what works for you to still provide to suppliers, please do. And we all learn on, on, at both ends of the supply chain that that would work. So I think those two things now come together. And what does that mean? Um, first of mm. the suppliers, I think, mm. are walking towards us with the efficiencies that can bring. Yeah. Yeah. And secondly, shelf space and SKU count will be at such a premium that suppliers will only uh, get get that shelf space with genuine new um, innovation. And so I think those two things will 
will create the perfect storm, if you like, that we'll really see see innovation again. And certainly from my perspective, we will we will happily give space to partners, to people who we think can bring uh, innovation and and reason to visit and theatre that that we're not operating ourselves uh, rather than more duplication. So the pressure's really on because we're giving we're giving suppliers another competitor, if you like, is which is giving our giving our space to a, a, a completely different um, a di- different partner uh, yeah. uh, if necessary. So yeah, I think we'll see loads of innovation. And as I say, back to the green space in our Middleton store, where you know we've got we've got lots of innovation around customers bringing your own, and we're proud to have worked with the brands. The brands are being fantastic with us in a big way of fill fill your own container. Uh, really removing plastic and non-recyclable packaging. I think it, this will all leave space and innovation for uh, for that agenda too. Well, there probably have been some category disruptions in terms of moving online faster. Essentials, you think of certain categories that could easily be, be more easily shopped online, which in, in my mind, this is probably one of the few times there's been a macro space disruption in a pretty condensed period. And I know macro space is very difficult to relay out and think about on any kind of short timeline because of the capital required. But uh, one of the things I've noticed is you you are doing store pilots and looking at that space. And as any disruption that goes through, those that are at least testing and learning new ideas have a better shot at leveraging uncertainty than those that weren't. And you think about restaurants that weren't, weren't exploring with takeout, really were caught flat hoof footed versus restaurants that had a takeout or a delivery service. And so, I mean, do you see a bunch, do you see a, a more pressure on macro thinking on space because of these changes? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think the, uh, the rate of skew reduction in, in, in many stores and super stores means that you have to face into the macro uh, reduction. So you increasingly compromise if you only look at the, the, the space of a category rather than reinventing the whole store you bang on and so uh, next year the rubber hits the road for us with really having those uh, major relays uh, which the skew the skew count um, uh, necessitate but actually give the opportunity for you know you can bluntly as a retailer you can fix things that you know haven't quite been right for yeah. for years that Chris file has never quite been big enough but to move it all the way around the shop has been a step too hard well you can do it now you can more refrigeration in that space where well, you can do it now so it, it forces you to that point but you're dead right you have to have that that big thinking in your thinking or you'll always be suboptimal in that new world it does put a pressure on a certain type of leader or the leadership you have or any retailer has to think about new things I mean, you're talking about now coming up with ideas you may not have tried before uh, and there's a certain uh, kind of a left brain leader that can get things done and repeat and scale and achieve based on the patterns they've seen. But then coming up with new ideas that you've not seen is a lot more difficult. And so um, how, what kind of leadership do you think it's going to take to lead in this new space going forward? Yeah, it, it, it is people who are prepared to, first of all, do the groundwork to understand, you know, we, we, not many of us sit there and come up with great ideas in isolation, in a vacuum. Most of us get ideas that we either see and, and blatantly copy or see and evolve or just by, by um, being across the supply base, the competition, listening to customers. Um, uh, and therefore, I think all that groundwork about being open to all those ideas um, and open to what might have seemed riskier um, in the past uh, more than more than ever before um, and, 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 and being open, you know, I think you know, the benefit of supermarkets, while it's felt like a really testing year, wow, in the grocery food industry, we have been blessed. Yeah in having a going concern, haven't we? And therefore, in that environment, um, it does allow us to uh, to reinvent. And, you know, we've got the oxygen, the oxygen um, to do that. But you, you know well, Andy, uh, you know, just as having a, a, a customer exec, you know, I've had a strategy exec, as, as most businesses do, but you have to, that strategy and strategic thinking has to permeate all the leadership and, and quickly be taken on. So partnerships will be a great example. You know, we'd start that within the, the strategy team of what would be a good partner, what areas 
Uh, mind we look to in the store where others can can do a better job than us and we should welcome them into our space uh, but now that that is that thought process is out amongst amongst the leaders and just when it might feel like turkey's voting to christmas for christmas to give up some of my space to a partner who i'm saying might do this better than i would people can now see that that brings additional reasons to the visit additional fear to additional benchmarking for our own proposition as well. Yeah, and, and how much faster way to learn. I mean, you, you you pick up learning so much faster by that partnering idea. And I think that's a great way to reduce, you're de-risking your own innovation, right? Because you can see and maybe not do the things they're not doing well and pick out some of your own paths on that space. So I think that's, I think that's brilliant. You know, Roger, one of the things that um, I see a lot and get a chance to talk to a lot of students that are just entering the workforce, so they will be in May, um, I would say probably a little bit of discouragement out there in terms of, you know, what does the world hold? What path are they going to go down? Am I going to get the right job or not job? Uh, but yet also it creates a great time of opportunity. And so what, probably the last question, what, what would you say to people that in that category, whether their first job or just thinking about getting, you know, just leaving university, what gives you hope? What gives you hope yeah. about, as you look at the future? Yeah, and, and gosh, my heart goes out to that generation and Andy of of people who have worked so hard for their for their education, just starting out on life. Not only is their social life being pretty hammered over here to be uh, almost non-existent, that that the, their ambitions and hopes and and the the, the jobs uh, the, the jobs and careers and learning the thought were there and might have seemed to evaporate. But first of all, I'd say. It, it, a level of normality, clearly it will never be the normal we knew, a level of normality will return. Secondly, all this, although this sounds brutal, um, COVID has accelerated the demise of some jobs, of some industries, of some businesses, that it's accelerated the demise that was probably going to happen anyway. So it's made things happen faster. So stay cool, things will get a lot better. Um, but also look around to the businesses that have prevailed, uh, done well in this time, see the opportunities that, that, that are there, the businesses that are expanding and doing well, and get close um, to those opportunities and those businesses. I, I firmly believe that applies just as much if you're just out of school as it does if you're a, a, a chief exec or an exec looking yeah. at where the opportunities are. Yeah. But, but it, it will get better and lots of opportunities um, will come from this. Well, I've, I've spoken to quite a few senior leaders, Roger, that tell me that there, there's been a, a culling a bit of leadership that the COVID has brought and it's really kind of shown them where the, the really great leaders are maybe a little bit more separating the pack a bit. If, if you could, what, what are some of the attributes of the leaders that are, have really shined through this and, and saw some, you saw some attributes there? Cause I think those would be good to hear about. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think it's uh, it, it's a real f ability to flex your style. So certainly in the early days of COVID, I think um, we needed as leaders to be more a little bit more top down, tell and do, no messing uh, than many of us might uh, might have previously felt was good or would see as as uh, as progressive leadership. But that was really important in a, a when there were no right answers. So somebody needed to decide, you know, right, that's what we're going to do, and, and B, when things were changing by the hour. Uh, but, uh, and, and that returns on a, on a daily or weekly basis, potentially, uh, you know, in, in the UK, right before this call, I was listening to the new restrictions being put in place. Uh, we have a tier system, tiers one to four in the UK, and different, uh, different areas have just gone into into new tiers. It's kind of like the, the US condensed that we've got yeah, yeah. so many different uh, different scenarios um, and so there's a bit of talent do straight away on what we'll need to do but then to quickly be able to pivot to a shepherd style leadership to a reassurance to uh, letting people uh, make decisions which they can make better locally in a scenario so I think it's that style flex of knowing when uh, on a daily hourly weekly basis to employ you know what what leadership style because right, and the opposite to that sort of quite central, centralized fast style has been 
uh, for example, the need this year to empower store managers locally on the ground, probably like we haven't done for many years, because yeah. you know I, they are the best the best person to know uh, how many customers exactly they can safely have in their store, for example. Yeah, that's that's a great example because you know. It, there's probably a lot of good reasons why you wouldn't do that empowerment at scale in a normal operating environment because you're trying to get some efficiencies and best practice learnings and but in this case it's the flexibility the, the ability to flex style to, to do that so that's that's great well roger i don't i think very few people understand the pressures and role that you have to carry in that role because um not only is it a, a large one of the uk's largest employers but you're feeding people food i mean this is life and so uh, just to commend you on, on a great job of holding that line and and doing that job as a real role model for a lot of a, a lot of people, including myself. And uh, again, I, I don't think uh, you probably have a lot of people that have the full empathy of what all those pieces connect and what they do. But it's a uh, it's important. And so, thank you for taking just a few minutes and sharing your insights because uh, they really have been hard won insights. Yeah, thank you. I've enjoyed catching up. Thanks for listening to the BigQuest podcast with Andy Murray. Make sure to head over to BigQuest.com to download our free checklist to launch your own BigQuest. On the website, you'll find resources and ideas around the method, mindset, and motivation concepts behind the BigQuest framework. If you like this episode, make sure to subscribe and leave a comment. We'd love to hear what resonated with you today. And if you want to share this podcast, we're available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, Google Play, and anywhere you listen to audio. Our goal with this podcast is to help passionate leaders think differently and make meaningful change. Be sure to subscribe so you'll be notified when the next episode goes live. Until next time, I'm Ben Ortlip here with Andy Murray, reminding you to think big and quest on. Hey.